From Plasse to Partition Chapter 7 Many Voices of a Nation Muslim Alienation The mainstream Indian nationalism, as it was developing gradually since the late 19th century under the aegis of the Indian National Congress, was contested incessantly from within the Indian society. What we find as a result is a series of alternative visions of nation, represented by a variety of minority or marginal groups who constantly challenged and negotiated with the Congress. The Muslims of India, as already noted, were the first to contest this version of nationalism and almost from the beginning many of them did not consider the Indian National Congress to be their representative. Between 1892 and 1909 only 6.59% of the Congress delegates were Muslims. Muslim leaders like Sayyid Ahmad Khan clearly considered it to be the representative of the majority Hindus. He was not anti-nationalist, but favoured a different conception of nation. For him the nation was a federation of communities having entitlement to different kinds of political rights depending on their ancestry and political importance, and the Muslims, being an ex-ruling class had a special place within the framework of the new cosmopolitan British Empire. This was in sharp contrast to the Congress vision of nation consisting of individual citizens. The prospect of the introduction of representative government created the political threat of a majority domination, which led to the formation of the All India Muslim League in 1906. This was the beginning of a search for distinctive political identity, not a quest for separate homeland, with a demand for the protection of their political rights as a minority community through the creation of separate electorate. The granting of this privilege of separate electorate by the colonial state in the Molimento reform of 1909 elevated them to the status of an All India political category, but positioned them as a perpetual minority in the Indian body politic. These structural imperatives of representative government henceforth began to influence the relationship between the Congress and the Muslim League. A brief period of compromise with the Congress followed the signing of the Lucknow Pact in 1916, which recognized the Muslim demand for separate electorate. But soon all such arrangements became irrelevant, as the whole structure of Indian politics was changed by the coming of Gandhi and the advent of the masses into the previously enclosed arena of nationalist politics. Gandhi by supporting the Khilafat movement, which used a pan-Islamic symbol to forge a pan-Indian Muslim unity, went a long way in producing unprecedented Hindu-Muslim rapport. But the movement died down by 1924 due to internal divisions and finally, because of the abolition of the caliphate through a republican revolution in Turkey under Kemal Pasha. But what is important, the Khilafat movement itself contributed further to the strengthening of Muslim identity in Punjab and Bengal. Frequent use of religious symbols by the overzealous ulma, who were pressed into service, highlighted the Islamic self of the Indian Muslims. It was indeed from the Khilafat movement that a serious communal riot erupted in Malabar in 1921. So this Muslim mobilization under the banner of Khilafat, as Christophe Jaffrelot, 1996, has argued, generated a sense of inferiority and insecurity among the Hindus, who in emulation of their aggressive other now started counter-mobilization. The Arya Samaj started a militant Shuddhi campaign in Punjab and UP and the Hindu Mahasbha launched its drive towards Hindu Sangathan, organization, in 1924, the Rashtriya Sway and Sevak Sangh, an overtly aggressive Hindu organization, was also born in the same year. The inevitable result of such mobilization along community lines was the outbreak of a series of riots between the Hindus and the Muslims in the 1920 affecting practically all parts of India. An exasperated Gandhi lamented in 1927 that the resolution of the problem of Hindu-Muslim relations was now beyond human control and had passed on to the hands of God. How do we explain this rapid deterioration of Hindu-Muslim relations in the wake of the decline of Khilafat movement? Gyanendra Pandey, 1985, has argued that in the 1920 there had been a remarkable shift in the Congress conceptualization of nationalism. 
There was now a distinct tendency to delegitimize religious nationalism by relegating religion to the private sphere. Congress leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru in their public pronouncements emphasized a secularist view of Indian nation, which was conceived to be above community interests. A binary opposition was visualized between nationalism and communalism, and therefore, whoever talked about community were dubbed as anti-nationalists or communalists. This eliminated the likelihood of accommodating the community identities within a composite nationhood and destroyed all possibilities of a rapprochement between the Congress and the Muslim League. The Muslims at this juncture, as Aisha Jalal argues, required a political arrangement capable of accommodating cultural differences. They looked for shared sovereignty. They were not against a united India, but contested Congress's claim to indivisible sovereignty. The public pronouncements of Congress secularism came at a time when religious identity was being articulated practically at every sphere of public life by both the Muslims as well as Hindus. So far as the latter were concerned, unlike the earlier nationalist leaders who used Hindu revivalist symbols but remained within the Congress framework, the present leaders of the Hindu Mahasbha decided to operate as a separate pressure group within the Congress trying constantly to marginalize the secularists and destroy any possibility of an understanding with the Muslims. There went on within the Congress, as Jafalot, 1996, shows, a constant contest between two rival concepts of nationalism, one based on the idea of composite culture, i.e. nation above community, and the other founded on the idea of racial domination of the Hindus, more particularly, of the subordination of the Muslims. What was significant, the protagonists of the former often gave way to or made compromises with those of the latter, giving ample reasons to the Muslims to be suspicious about the real intent of Congress politics. This contestation was visible very clearly in the arena of institutional politics, which the Swarajist group within the Congress, under the leadership of Motilal Nehru and Sia Das, had decided to re-enter, with Gandhi's endorsement, following the withdrawal of the non-cooperation movement. At the municipal level, in UP, the alliance between the Swarajists and the Kilifatists won most of the seats in 1923 on a note of communal harmony. But their support base was systematically undercut by the Hindu Mahasbha under Madan Mohan Malvi, whose actions contributed to further Hindu-Muslim tension that resulted in riots in Allahabad and Lucknow in 1924. In the next municipal election of 1925, the Swarajists lost all seats to the Hindu Mahasabhites. In the Muslim-majority province of Punjab, communal tension escalated in the wake of the Municipal Amendment Act of 1923, which by providing additional seats for Muslims reduced the Hindus to a minority in the municipal boards. With the blessings of Malvi and the Hindu Mahasbha, the local Hindus took up cudgels against Muslims, and so intense was the communal hatred that when Gandhi came to Lahore in December 1924 to restore harmony, the local Hindus gave him a cold shoulder. On the Muslim side, leaders like Muhammad Ali, who favoured communal harmony and once visualised India as a federation of faiths, were now marginalised, and leaders like Dr. Kichlu, who were once staunchly in favour of Hindu-Muslim unity, now turned uncompromisingly against any communal reconciliation. At the Central Legislative Assembly, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, elected by the Bombay Muslims, appeared as the most prominent spokesman of the Muslims. Jinnah's preference for constitutional methods and abhorrence for agitational politics had driven him away from Gandhian Congress. But now after the withdrawal of non-cooperation, when Congress once again reverted to constitutionalism under the Swarajists, he was willing to cooperate with them. His independent party formed an alliance with the Swarajists and together they came to be known as the Nationalist Party in the Assembly. But at the same time, he focused on reviving the Muslim League at its Lahore session in 1923, decided to work on a new constitutional arrangement for India, and for that purpose, wanted to renegotiate the Lucknow Pact with the Congress. Although Swarajists were willing, the Mahasabites like Malvi, B.S. Munje and Lajpat Rai were not, 
and they successfully torpedoed all efforts at reconciliation. Even the Bengal Pact, which C.R. Das had negotiated with the local Muslims, was rejected at the Kokonada session of the Congress in December 1923 on the ground that a national issue could not be resolved on a provincial basis. In the meanwhile, outside the arena of institutional politics, mobilization of Hindus around the claim of a right to play music before mosques was gathering momentum in various parts of the country. From the late 19th century, indeed, as mentioned earlier, Chapter 5.4, Ever since the colonial state started defining a new public sphere, contest over sacred space, such as a dispute over the route of a religious procession, was fast becoming the bone of communal contention and a mode of defining communal identities in India. And now, as the public contest for contending community rights became sharper, as over the cow slaughter protection issue in the 1890, Ritual space came to be defined by acoustic range and became a major symbol of communal mobilization throughout India. Gandhi described this tradition of playing music in public as a non essential aspect of Hinduism. But in a war of symbols, such non essentials became non negotiable demands for those wanting to mobilize communities along religious lines. This issue was used in Lip, Punjab, and Bengal to consolidate Hindu solidarity and in CP and Bombay to divert attention from the rising tide of anti-Brahmanism. This music before mosque not only sparked off a series of violent riots between 1923 and 1927, but also in the election of 1926 it became an emotive issue dividing the electorate along communal lines. Within the Congress, Swarajists like Motilal Nehru were now being increasingly sidelined and they succumbed to pressure to nominate Pramahasba candidates. There was not a single Muslim among the Congress candidates in Bengal or Punjab in 1926, elsewhere all the Congress Muslim candidates lost. The majority of the elected Congress members were those with known pro-Hindu sympathies. A resolution condemning separate electorate for Muslims was just prevented from being passed at the Guwahati Congress by timely intervention of Gandhi and Nehru. But the process of renegotiating the Lucknow Pact was finally derailed by the Mahasabites at the All Parties Conference at Delhi in January 1928. It is not difficult to understand why Muslim support for Congress further diminished around this time. Aligarh Muslims now became afraid of being swamped by Hindus. Shaukat Ali ruefully observed in 1929 that Congress ha d become an adjunct of Hindu Mahasbha. Muslim alienation from Congress politics was then boldly inscribed in their large-scale abstention from the civil disobedience and the quit India movements. This Muslim alienation, often stigmatized in Indian historiography as communalism, is a contentious issue among historians. One way to explain it is to dismiss it as false consciousness of a self-seeking petty bourgeoisie and misguided workers and peasants who mistakenly saw their interests through the communal mirror and sought to safeguard them with constitutional privileges. Their frustration increased in the years after 1929 as depression constricted opportunities, leading to more tension, conflicts and violence. On the other hand, it is also to a large extent true that the imperatives of representative government, the granting of separate electorate and conferment of minority status by the colonial state, contributed to the forging of an all-India Muslim political identity. It is, therefore, explained in terms of Islamic ideas of representation founded on ascriptive criteria, Muslims like to be represented by Muslims alone, and not by those who were not members of their community. While dismissal of communalism as a false consciousness does not take us anywhere so far as understanding of this political vision is concerned, the latter argument about a hegemonic Islamic ideology is also problematic. This explanation is essentially based on the assumption of a substantive ideological consensus within the Muslim community, which has been questioned by a number of historians. The Muslims were not a political community yet, not even in the late 1930. There had been positional differences and ideological contestation within Muslim politics from its very beginning. Even in the 1930, 
Muslim politics remained caught in provincial dynamics as their interests in Bengal and Punjab, where they were a majority, were different from those of others in the minority provinces. In Bengal, the Krishat Praja Party under A.K. Fajlul Haq mobilized both the Muslim and lower caste Hindu peasants on class-based demands and competed with the Muslim League after its revival in 1936 for Muslim votes. In Punjab, the Unionist Party led by Faisalai Hussain, Sikandar Hayat Khan, as well as the Jat peasant leader Chhotu Ram, appealed to a composite constituency of Muslim, Hindu and Sikh rich landlords and peasant producers, who had benefited from the Punjab Land Alienation Act of 1900 and had a complete control over rural politics. The All India Muslim League, on the other hand, was until 1937, as Aisha Jalal puts it, little more than a debating forum for a few articulate Muslims in the minority provinces and had made no impact on the majority provinces. In the election of 1937, both the regional parties did well, while Muslim League had a dismal performance throughout India. The resounding victory of the Congress in this election and the arrogance that it bred, however, gradually brought all these divergent groups together under the banner of a revived and revitalized Muslim League under the leadership of Jinnah. As partners of the Raj, as R.J. Mori, 1988, has shown, the Muslims had politically gained a lot in the 1920 and 1930. The doctrine of separate electorate was now firmly enshrined in the Indian constitution. They had wrested power from the Congress in the majority provinces of Bengal and Punjab. And to other Muslim majority areas, Sindh and the Northwest Frontier Province had been elevated to full provincial status. All these came to be threatened by the Congress victory in the 1937 elections. Not only did Congress refuse to enter into any coalition government in the minority provinces like UP to share power with the Muslim League, but Jawaharlal Nehru declared with supreme arrogance that there were now only two parties in the Indian political scene, the Raj and the Congress. From now on, there was a steady Congress propaganda against separate electorate and a constant vilification of the Muslim League as unpatriotic and reactionary. In view of the electoral debacle of the Muslim League, Nehru launched his Muslim mass contact campaign to bring in the Muslim masses into Congress fold. But the endeavor failed as the Hindu Mahasabites sabotaged it from within. The Muslims, particularly in the minority provinces, had now ample reasons to be afraid of Hindu domination. There were numerous complaints of discrimination against Muslims by the Congress ministries. Whether true or imagined, these reflected the Muslim sense of missing out from the patronage distribution system created by the new constitutional arrangement of 1935. The class approach in Congress policies and its emphasis on individual citizenship, in other words, failed to satisfy the community-centric concerns of the Muslims. It was this collective sense of fear and dissatisfaction, which was politically articulated by Jinnah, who came back to India in 1934 after a short period of self-imposed exile in London, to take up the leadership of the Muslim League. But between 1934 and 1937 Jinnah was still willing to cooperate with the Congress at the centre with a view to revising the federal constitutional structure provided by the Act of 1935. The election results, however, put him in a disadvantageous position, as Congress could now comfortably choose to ignore him. What Jinnah wanted at this stage was to make the Muslim League an equal partner, a third party, in any negotiation for the future constitution of India. The passage of the Shariat Application Act in 1937, with spirited advocacy by Jinnah in the Central Legislative Assembly, provided a symbolic ideological basis for Muslim solidarity on a national scale, transcending all divisive internal political debates. He launched a mass contact campaign and pressed the ulma into service, while the emotionally charged Aligarh students further galvanized the campaign. In November 1939, when the Congress ministries resigned in protest against India being drawn into World War II without consultation, Jinnah decided to celebrate it as a deliverance day. 
By December 1939, the Muslim League membership had risen to more than 3 million and Jinnah had projected himself as their sole spokesman. Within this political context of estrangement and distrust, another idea gradually germinated and that was the notion of Muslim nationhood. In 1930, Sir Muhammad Iqbal, as president of the Muslim League, Ziyad proposed the constitution of a centralized territory for Islam within India by uniting the four provinces of Punjab, Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh and Baluchistan. The idea was further elaborated by the Cambridge student Rahmat Ali, who in 1933 vaguely talked about Pakistan to be constituted of the four Muslim provinces and Kashmir. It was, however, at the Karachi meeting of the Sindh branch of the Muslim League, presided over by Jinnah himself, that a resolution was passed which mentioned the need for political self-determination of the two nations, known as Hindus and Muslims, and asked the Muslim League to think of appropriate measures to realize it. It was the first declaration of the two-nation theory, but it was not separatism yet. The two federations of Hindus and Muslims were meant to be united through a common center. Since then, public discussions went on about the practicality of a constitutional arrangement that could give shape to this abstract notion, with intellectual inputs coming from a variety of Muslim leaders, from the Sindhi leader Abdullah Harun, Dr. Syed Abdul Latif, Abdul Bashir of the Pakistan Majlis in Lahore, to the prominent Aligarh scholars, Prof. Syed Jafrul Hassan and Dr. M. H. Kadri. Finally, the Lahore Resolution of the Muslim League in March 1940 formally proclaimed the Muslims as a nation. It did not mention partition or Pakistan, but only talked about independent states to be constituted of the Muslim-majority provinces in an unspecified future. The resolution, in other words, only signaled the transformation of Indian Muslims from a minority to a nation so that no future constitutional arrangement for India could any more be negotiated without their participation and consent. The central plank in Jinnah's politics henceforth was to be a demand for parity between the Hindus and the Muslims in any such arrangement. The road from this declaration of nationhood to the actual realization of a separate sovereign state in 1947 was long and tortuous. It may suffice here to mention that this conceptualization of a Muslim nation was not the imagining of Jinnah alone or of a select group of articulate intellectuals. It was legitimated by thousands of ordinary Muslims who joined the processions at Karachi, Patna or Lahore, participated in the Hattals, organized demonstrations or even took part in riots between 1938 and 1940 and their alienation was born of provocations from the militant Hindu nationalists, as well as constant sneering by an intransigent secularist leadership of the Congress. For Muslim leaders, who in 1921 saw no conflict between their Indianist and Muslim identity, recognition of their separate Muslim nationhood became a non-negotiable minimum demand in the 1940s. And gradually these sentiments were shared by a wider Muslim population. Indeed, as Achin Vanayak has argued, the Congress-led national movement cannot escape most of the responsibility for this emergence of a separate Muslim identity, at a period when an anti-colonial pan-Indian national identity was in the making. If you like this video so please do like, share this video, and hit the subscribe button.